What's the word, y'all? Welcome back to the playoff recap. We had some big things happen today. Some teams that we thought might have been down and out fight back to, to keep a series alive. We got a legendary performance from a 17-22. I don't know how old Jason Tatum really is. I know the memes, but I legitimately couldn't tell you. Is, is he 23? He's old enough to father a child um, because Deuce is always in the court after Pops put up a big game. It's, every time Jason Tatum puts up 40-plus, you can expect to see his son somewhere really close. Seems like his son is only there when things are these are going great. Was, was, was his son there for those first two games? Maybe he wasn't there. And that was why Jason Tatum played so bad in those first two. Actually, Deuce is not jumping on the bandwagon. He is the he is the controlling factor in Jason Tatum's performances. But we'll get to that a little bit later. Uh, let's start off with the first game of the day. The Atlanta Hawks get a win at home. Take the lead on this series. When they uh, lost game two, Trey Young was walking off the court. We see y'all in the A. We see y'all in the A. They saw him in the A. And uh, they, he, they kicked him in the A as well. You know what I'm saying? This man, Trey Young, came out. And it's just so cool to see so many young players in this year's playoffs. Like, think about all the young players that are leading a team or just having big-time performances. We saw three. In every single game today, we saw a player that is younger than 24, 23, I don't know, um, have historic great performances, right? We got Trey Young. We got we got um, Luka Doncic, even though they end up losing. And, of course, Jason Tatum that we just talked about. It's just so cool to see, man. You just, you just can't help but to look at it and be like the NBA is in good hands because I'm projecting that all three of these players will be in the playoffs a bunch throughout their career and they can I guess only get better to some extent but the Atlanta Hawks get another win and a lot of that is due to the fact that uh, nobody showed up for the New York Knicks they had literally no offense other than Derrick Rose and I felt so bad for D Rose man because these are those type of performances that if you get a win with a performance like this you want you everywhere every time Derrick Rose does have a great performance um, it's all over Sports Center because everybody loves Derrick Rose. He's a fan favorite across the entire league, across the entire globe. Everybody knows that. But to put up 30 and be the only source of offense in the playoff game kind of sucked for D Rose, man. Uh, Julius Randle, third game in a row where he was just absolutely, absolutely terrible. And I've been seeing people calling him a fraud and all these type of things. Oh, shouldn't have won most of the player. And that's always so weird to me. It's literally a regular season award. You know, it's a regular season award. And it's not like, I don't know. I, I never understand it. But he's getting... Clamped up to the maximum. Um, I'm giving a lot of credit to Nate McMillan. I'm giving a lot of credit, and I mean a ton of credit to this man, uh, DeAndre Hunter. Going into this series, I think one of the things I said in my preview is Julius Randle averaged like 40 points per game against them this season. Look it up. It, it was close to 40 points per game in those three games they played against Atlanta. And I'm like, bro, um, obviously he could just dominate this team. He did it all regular season. But what I did not remember, what I did not realize is DeAndre Hunter didn't play in two out of the three games of the regular season. And DeAndre Hunter is one of those dudes that is going to be one of the greater perimeter defenders in this league. He's already great. <laughs> he's already great. And he's a, he's a relatively young player. I know he spent a couple years in college instead of the typical one and done that we see nowadays. But he's a young player, and he has the ability to do something like guard a guy that is as physical as Julius Randle. Because there's one thing that Julius Randle loves, and that is contact. He absolutely loves contact. He's banging bodies. He's a strong old man. The Atlanta Hawks match that energy and have been destroying them. They've been, they've been shutting them out. There was plays in this game where Gallinari, who's never been known as a great defender, um, he had his years where he's actually pretty solid, I guess, but never known as a great defender, gets to Julius Randle aside, and he's drawing fouls. He's getting in the picking pockets and causing turnovers. You're like, man, they really had a scheme. Because, honestly speaking, New York Knicks had that run um, like a like a month and a half, two month run where their offense was like top ten. But other than that, for the rest of the regular season, they weren't an amazingly um, gifted offensive team. They had they had held their hat on the defensive side of the ball, and for the most part in this series, they've been doing a, a decent job defending. But in 2021, putting up 94 points in a game is typically a L, right? Um, so they've never been a great offensive team. So the maybe Miller's like, hey, we're gonna focus on their all star. Take him out of the game completely and let everything else uh, fall into place. R.J. Barrett has another really bad game. The top two scorers for this team in the regular season both put up stinkers. Four for, if I, four for 24 as, a, as those two alone for uh, 21 points. That's me doing quick mathematics with my uh, somewhat of a high school degree. College degree? A little bit of both. A little bit of both. Um, is it over for the New York Knicks? Not by any means. Not by any means. Because the one thing we could take away from another game in this today of Jason Tatum going off for 50 is that 
it just takes a switch. Jason Tatum was terrible for the first two games. Terrible for his standards. Like, I think he was averaging, what, 15 points per game? That's unacceptable for a guy like Jason Tatum. Just like it is unacceptable for a guy like Julius Randle, who's an all-star, to play like this. But he could be better, and he probably will be better in game number four. I, maybe it's a possibility that he does suck um, in game number four as well. But a lot of credit to the Atlanta Hawks, man. Uh, Clint Capella, I don't know how I got this far into it without mentioning the name Clint Capella. Because if you watch my podcast or listen to my podcast, uh, you know that I had Clint Capella in like top three of my defensive player of the year voting. And hopefully you saw some of that or you're seeing some of that in the playoffs right now. Um, when he's on the court, the defense is just ridiculous. And you saw a lot of that. John Collins still hasn't had a game just yet in the playoffs. Um, getting early fouls in game two and an early foul in game three he finished with 14 points but I'm assuming that John Collins is going to have a performance that's over 20 points relatively soon I don't know if it's this series and if they get out of this series I don't know if it's next series but John Collins is too talented of an offensive player for him to only be putting up 14 points and then Lou Williams had a, a stretch where he scored like what six points by himself and that has happened in a, a couple of these games where they ended up winning so shout out to the Atlanta Hawks taking his lead I know that players or, or people like like Spike Lee, who are the diehard fans that are traveling with, not with the team, because I don't think he's on the plane. I think he like he's got enough money to get his own little private jet. Games like this, and I understand they have two games in Atlanta, but you fly on a private jet to watch your team in the playoffs, and then they lose. Like I would be kind of mad on that that plane ride home. Like I was on the team, but they got one more game in Atlanta. Now if they lose both of those, then yeah, Spike Lee's uh, plane ride back home is going to be uh, not amazing. Let's move on to the next game. The next game is the Brooklyn Nets versus the Boston Celtics. Like I mentioned a couple times throughout the series, it is very hard for me to focus in on two games at the same time. And while the Atlanta Hawks and the New York Knicks game was um, going on, the Brooklyn Nets and Boston Celtics game started, and I mean, I was keeping up with it, but obviously I won't go as in-depth in this one as I would be in some of the other games, unfortunately, because I, I guess I missed, I didn't miss it, but I didn't get the full extent of an absolute banger of Jason Tatum dropping 50. Um, if you watch my podcast, you know that when we were previewing this series, what I said is for the for the Boston Celtics to just get at least one game, two things have to happen. Jason Tatum needs to go for 50, and they need to kill the offensive glass. Both of those things happened today. Look at me. Now, I'm wrong about a lot of stuff, but I'm going to run away with this win. <laughs> I'm running away with this win. Jason Tatum putting up 50. And the crazy thing is the way he got the 50. The Brooklyn Nets, I mean, it took him a very, very long time to stop switching Kevin Durant off of him. Like, it would be the smallest, the little, little screens. And they're like, all right, all right, you're, it's your assignment now, Kyrie. And Kyrie's, what, six, seven inches shorter? And Jason Tatum's just going to shoot over you. Then they start to bring a double team. It didn't matter. He was shooting over the double team of James Harden and uh, Kyrie Irving. He's one of those guys, man, that can single-handedly bring you a victory because he is so gifted on the offensive side of the ball, and he's only this many years old. I don't know what the number is. He's He's young. He's young, and he's already doing these things at the biggest moments and the biggest stages. And, and at home, it's big, man. A lot of people counted them out, and I'm going to keep it a buck. I'm still picking Brooklyn to win the series. Um, I, This game doesn't change that. But it's good to see the fight in them, especially after those first two games. Like, the last recap we had on the day, a game day for them, I told you, I stopped watching after three minutes. It is very rare for me to be like, I don't want to watch this playoff game. That is how bad they had been as a team leading up into this game. So you got the 50-point um, for Jason Tatum, and then the last couple minutes, Marcus Smart showed his value. I mean, I guess throughout the entire game, he shot 72, 73% from the field. But what I saw in the last couple minutes was him drawing fouls on Kyrie Irving, him drawing fouls on Kevin Durant out of a timeout, hit him hitting shots, and him being that leader that you need him to be. Um, a lot of people expect him to be. It's unfortunate that... Of course, they're missing Jalen Brown. I mean, this team is significantly different with Jalen Brown, but Marcus Smart stepping up. Kimball Walker had a dreadful um, game when it comes to scoring the ball, but he hit one of the biggest shots in the game, and he ended with a bunch of rebounds. Speaking of rebounds, Christian Thompson was the reason that they killed on the offensive side of the offensive uh, glass, ending with nine offensive rebounds by himself. Right? The Brooklyn Nets, that is their – the reason I had said – Whatever team is going against the Brooklyn Nets and is going to beat the Brooklyn Nets needs to kill the offensive glass. There's a reason I said that because they don't have that. They don't have the great defensive rebounding player. They have um, DeAndre Jordan, but DeAndre Jordan doesn't get PT anymore. He's just saying as good as he was back in the day. So, like, yes, like I said, the Brooklyn Nets are winning this series, right? Next round, they're probably going against Milwaukee. Milwaukee is an amazing offensive, offensive uh, rebounding team. Could that be the X factor? We, we go, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. I know I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but that could be the X factor determining what and who wins that series. Uh, you got a 40-piece from James Harden that didn't mean a thing. Kyrie had a struggle of a game for him, but like KD 
and James Harden um, had 80? Is that my 80? They had 96 points as a big three and lost. 96 out of 119. Nobody else showed up for him. Um, and they end up losing this game. The next one. Oh, man. The, oh, man. This is a crazy one because the way it started off, you thought this series was over. Jalen Rose said this is the biggest game in Clippers history going into it. And I completely understand why. Now, I can see an argument of last year, Game 7, against uh, Denver being the biggest game of history. But this one might be bigger just because um, – Kawhi could walk, <laughs> and losing Kawhi sets you back dramatically. Uh, but they end up getting his win, right? I mean, Luka Doncic comes out. What he hits the first eight points for the team, and then Tim Hardaway Jr. hits another one, and now it's 11 to two to start the game. You know, the Clippers are getting punched in the mouth because they ty- oh, credit to Ty Lue. I-, I can't believe I'm saying this. Credit to Ty Lue. It took them two games and a couple minutes into game number three to realize this that you can't be switching Zubas into Luka Doncic. I don't know why it took him so long, but eventually after Luka scored, you know what, eight points in the first quarter, he was like, you know what, Zubac, you got to come out. And the only reason Zubac is there is because you have like Porzingis, you have Dorian Finney-Smith. These are bigger guys. These are big forwards. So you need a guy like Zubac to box out. Box out. I, mean, I guess not because Porzingis doesn't rebound the ball. But a guy like Zubac, you can see his value um, when it comes to the little things. But they switch everything. So there's no value in that because Luke is going to see that. He's going to step back and he's going to hit that shot. Uh, Tyron Lue takes him out of the game. And then this is where the superstar power of the Clippers took over because we had Kawhi Leonard starting off, I think, nine for nine from the field. And then Paul George decided he wanted to take off, take off and um, have one of his best games of the series or his best game of the series, one of his best games of the season because of the stakes that are involved in it. Big time moments from him, big time game from them. And then, hey, the one of the things we said when we were recapping game number two is that like this team was one of the best three point shooting, was the best three point shooting team in the entire league. And I didn't project that they were going to continue to shoot 20 percent from three guys like Marcus Morris, who was like number two in the entire league at three point percentage, had a number two type of three point percentage game. You know what I'm saying? He shot three for five. So those are the little things that, that matter Reggie Jackson gets inserted to start lineup he has a positive impact if you ask me um and it's just they played better in this game even when they could have rolled over because of how bad it started I mean if they would have went down 3-0 wow the amount of uh memes everything on Twitter you know how the world hates the Clippers like the video that I dropped about the Clippers three days ago or whenever game two was was one of my best performing videos of all time and I didn't even have anything clickbaity in the title. I just said they embarrassed themselves, which was a fact in game number two. Like, I'm going to have something in the title today about the Clippers winning a game, and I guarantee you it doesn't do as good because it's not as fun to give Clippers the praise. <laughs> but they deserve it after this game. Um, they deserve it after this game. But the Dallas Mavericks still have home, home court advantage. It's made Luka Doncic. The biggest thing from Luka Doncic that I could take away is as beautiful as he was, a 44-point game. The man got to hit his free throws, bro. Oh, my God. It was hard to watch. For a guy that gets to the free throw line as much as he, he does, or a guy that, like, I believe he's going to get better at drawing fouls throughout his career. He's still super young. He shot 13 free throws today. He shot 7 for 13 as a guard, as the point guard. That's that's un- unacceptable, honestly. Um, there are not many superstar players that can get away with this type of free throw percentage. I think LeBron is, like, the only one. Um, but, like, the elite of the elite scorers in the league – typically are at least positive free throw shooters and Luca has to get to that point sometime in his career because I feel like it's going to bite him eventually um him missing a couple free throws today six free throws today in the grand scheme doesn't matter I guess if he hits every single one of these free throws they still lose but it might hurt them down the line sometime it might hurt them down the line shout out to Kawhi shout out to PG for keep fighting and that's pretty much it man tomorrow's slate of games we have game four of Milwaukee versus Miami could it be the end of the series we oh it's tomorrow Saturday oh I love Saturday but I hate it too because there's basketball all day and sometimes a brother just needs some some sunlight we don't get that around here very often on Saturdays and Sundays because the first game starts at 12 30 my time 12 30 12 30 and they won't stop it till like what midnight they gonna give you an hour little thing between game two and between game three they give you like an hour to take a nap and that's simply what I do then after that, it's like, bro, it's a straight basketball. It's a blessing and a curse, but uh, it's part of my job. I got to sit here and do those things. So let me know what you think about these three games, man. Shout out to Tatum. Shout out to Kawhi and PG. And shout out to Trey Young and DeAndre Hunter. I guess Clint Capella. And Kevin Herter. And Lou Williams. Everybody play well for them.